being honest is not easy. It's very difficult. Right. You should be afraid of it. I didn't write a book about how to achieve comfort. I wrote a book about how to achieve results. I'd like to welcome Peter Kozadoy to the Productivity is Podcast. Peter, thanks for joining me today. It is absolutely my pleasure. It's good to be here. So your book is entitled Honest to Greatness, How Today's Greatest Leaders Use Brutal Honesty to Achieve Massive Success. And when I came across this book and, and the first word that stood out to me was the idea of honesty is, is something that I really want to make sure that, that I espouse to as, as often as possible. Um, if not, like it, it, it marries itself nicely with integrity. What led yourself to saying, hey, you know what? This is the book that needs to be out there right now, and I'm the guy that's got to write it. Yeah. Well, you know, the thing about writing a book about honesty, Mike, is I, you know, I get to be honest. I kind of have to be. Yep. And the truth is I never set out to write about, speak about, or frankly, even care about honesty. I set out to write a marketing book because mm -hmm. in my trials and tribulations of going from uh, you know, a fresh out of college entrepreneur, not knowing his uh, butt from his elbow, to growing an, an Inc. 5000 uh, marketing agency with my business partner, we encountered cultures and, and leadership teams from startups to the Fortune 500 and even got to work for Warren Buffett himself. And I was always fascinated by a problem that I couldn't figure out. And it was that with some of our clients, you know, we would go into uh, their organizations and give them you know, growth strategies and work with their frontline employees and unearth insights from their customers and, and give them back like all this great stuff. Or like, hey, here's what people are saying about you. Here's what, what we need to do. And they would do it and they would just crush it. You know, they'd get like a five, six times ROI in their investment with us. They'd stay with us for years. Everything was great. Others, Mike, we would work with, give the same love, care, attention, insights, the whole shebang, and they would just blow up on the launch pad. They would descend into infighting and politics and ego and bias and BS. And I couldn't figure it out for the life of me. I mean, I used to walk away from some meetings saying, these, these people are idiots. Um, now, you know, that wasn't true. That was me being an idiot, right? Mm. No executive rises to be an executive uh, that, you know, doesn't have a couple of good neurons bouncing around in the skull there. But what I ended up deciding through you know, my experience and through research and really digging into this is that it wasn't stupidity that prevents otherwise well-meaning executives from, you know, powering their organizations through to the, the transformations they need. It's actually dishonesty on some level. And I don't mean, you know, outright lying for their own benefit. It, it's nothing that uh, deliberate. It's usually the, the accidental lies that organizations and their leaders drift into. You know, they, they fail to get honest about what's going on in the world around them. They fail to get honest about what their fellow executives or, or customers or employees are saying. And they fail to get honest with themselves that their own bias and ego and self-limiting beliefs often trickle down to the detriment of an organization. And, and that's how they get stuck. And so once I saw it through this lens I, I couldn't unsee it. You know, it started popping up in all these stories of, of organizations that tanked and, and those that just you know, crushed it and dominated their industries. And so uh, that's why I ended up actually, my agent said to me, like, this is great, but this is not a book about marketing. It's a book about honesty. You know? And I was like, well, clearly you didn't read the front page because it doesn't say anything <laughs> about that. But he was, he was absolutely right. And, um, and that's sort of the, the surprise campaign that I find myself on. Why do we get stuck in the trap of dishonesty? Like, what, how does that happen? Because it, to me, it seems like, you know, there's that old adage of, you know, you tell one lie and then it leads to another and leads to another. And it's hard once you've got this tangled web, it's very hard to untangle it and get out of it without, you know, just kind of, it almost gets to the point where you have to keep track of, of where you've been forthright and where you've kind of been, you know, elusive. Why is it so hard to shift from that mentality? And how do you, I mean, the book's obviously going to get into that to a degree as well, but what did you find as you're going through this that was some of the challenges with shifting to this idea of becoming honest so that you can be great? Oh, gosh. I mean, there's so, so many great ways to answer that question. You know, psychologically, we can trick our amygdala into being okay with our own lies. You know, the amygdala is that, that sort of uh, emotional center that will go off, give us the pit in our stomach when we know we're not being honest. And the thing is, if we're dishonest more and more, we can actually sort of suppress those gut feelings and, and trick ourselves into thinking that what we're doing is okay. But so, so that's what's going on in our, in our 
brains, but there's a, a thing about society. You know, I, one of the stories I tell in my book is I go way back to, to ancient Rome and even back further to ancient Egypt. And I talk about the Hall of Two Truths. Have you ever heard about this in the Egyptian mythology? It's ringing a bell, but uh, go through it because it's been one of those things that where there's so many stories you can get from the past, especially from mythology and stuff that they kind of blend together. Go ahead and, and, and kind of recant it for me again. So, so imagine you're an ancient Egyptian, right? You, you walk out of the marketplace and you're momentarily blinded by the searing hot desert sun. You trip over your sandals, you go ass over tea kettle down the stone steps and land in a pile of unripe melons. Your brains go everywhere, you're dead, right? Mm -hmm. In the next instant, you would be transported to a mythical place called the Hall of Two Truths. And in the Hall of Two Truths would be a scale. On one end of the scale would be your beating heart. And on the other would be the feather of ma'at, the feather of truth. And the idea behind the story was that if you were a, an individual who lived with good values, who treated others well, you, know, you were a morally beneficial contributor to society, your heart would balance out with the feather of truth and you'd be admitted into the afterlife. Now, of course, we have many of those types of tales throughout all our religions. It helps to structure and an environment and a culture of people who support each other instead of, you know, go to war, you know, every, uh, every second that they can. The problem is a couple centuries into this, the Amun priests got wise and they said to themselves, if everyone has to pass through this test and wants to get into the afterlife, perhaps we can give people a, you know, a Disney fast pass to it and charge for that. So they started to literally provide scrolls that only the wealthy could buy. And if you had this scroll and this special incantation that you essentially would bypass this test of morality and be entered into the afterlife, no matter how many people you had screwed over in the interim. So we have had this perversion of money and morals for so long. The problem that I point out in my book what is different now is that in ancient Egypt, we didn't know anything, right? <laughs> we mm -hmm. were all sitting around believing in the afterlife. We had no you know, science to, to you know, argue otherwise, not that we do today, but we know a lot more certainly about you know, the universe and the, the world we live in, how it all works. So now what's happened, if you take a look at the news and you can pick up fresh examples daily, folks who are doing things for the sake of money that damage others or their companies or the environment or workers or whatever, they're being called out for it. I mean, look at the Volkswagen diesel emission scandal, the Wells Fargo fake account scandal, the whole Jeffrey Epstein episode, the whole Black Lives Matter movement. It, that, like All of this stems from the complete transparency that we now have as information fires around the world so rapidly. And the premise of the book is, in, is that in an environment like that, where there really is you know, nowhere to hide, it is no longer going to pay to do anything but be honest and transparent. And by the way, the leaders and organizations that I profile in my book that use honesty, not as a touchy-feely core value, but as a business strategy to achieve results, they are the ones who are making way more profitability. They are the ones that are dominating their industries. And it's all literally using something we learned when we were in like you know, preschool. You know, it's interesting you talk about the, the strategic part. And as as we were leaning into this, I remember um, one of the things when I was working at Costco and I was dealing with one of the managers there, one of my higher ups, and I wanted to be promoted. And one of the things that uh, he had said, and I was a younger guy, I was in my early 20s, and he had said, you have all the hard skills to do it. It's the soft skills that we need you to work on. And those, you know, those aren't as easy to make work or get Amen to in, that. In, yeah so honesty to me it's it's interesting because you talk about honesty as a business strategy versus and when you were writing the book you said you know hey i set out to write a marketing book which seems very tactical and strategic and there's but there is something about that soft skill uh, and the soft skill set that really matters um how are you able to in your work and in the book particularly um able to say okay this is a soft skill this is why instead of you going and reading some blog posts or picking up, you know, a very definitive tactical strategic guide about like here, because you do in, in part two of the, you know, in the, in the second area, you talk about sales, marketing, finance, management, like the, the very, very qualitative in some, or quantitative and qualitative, you know, like this, these str strategies and yet imbuing and, and kind of, uh, you know, throwing it, honesty in there. How can someone that gets so caught up in the numbers and in the, the stuff that's easy to measure 
put honesty at the forefront as as an effective business strategy? Well, luckily, I think over the past couple of decades, uh, you know, we have folks like Peter Drucker saying, you know, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Mm. We know this to be true, right? The reason why I ended up, you know, getting to honesty as a thing was I was tired of coming in as a marketing agency too late in the process. You know, the, the executives had already let their biases and in ego interfere in what they were trying to achieve. And so, you know, my thing with honesty was we need to go to the root cause of what helps decision makers, key decision makers. And by the way, that's not just executives, that's middle managers and, and frontline employees. And I, I have chapters for them in my book as well, you know, of how to wield this. But, you know, what's the root cause of this? If we can't get honest with who we are as people, who we are as a team, who we are as a company, what we stand for, whether we, you know, you said the word integrity earlier, do we actually live by our core values or is a, a bunch of horse crap? You know, like what, what, what are we doing here? The root cause of that is honesty. So when you talk about, you know, how do we make the hard skills work? As long as business is about people and not about robots, then we need to be honest, both with ourselves, with the others around us, about the others around us, you know, how they think, how they feel, how they may feel differently than we are, how delicate their egos are. We can't achieve anything if we aren't honest, you know, mm -hmm. about you know, what, what's driving us and what we are trying to achieve and whether that's even the right objective in the first place. And if we fail at those very fundamental things, none of the other things matter. Meal planning is important because it prevents us from being a disappointed wreck when dinner time comes around and we have no clue what to make or even if we have the ingredients to make the meal. It's a time and a money saver, but most importantly, it frees up valuable brain space. Creating a meal plan prepares us for the week to come and gives us peace of mind that we're organized and can feed ourselves and our family. That's why I do it and that's why Plan to Eat helps me do it. Your subscription includes access to the Plan to Eat website and fully featured mobile apps on iOS and Android. And Plan to Eat gives you the tools to clip and organize recipes from any website, the ones your family loves and that fit your dietary preferences and needs. And you can create a meal plan around your schedule. Then what happens is the Plan to Eat software automatically creates an organized shopping list based on your plan. So sign up for your free trial at plantoeat.com slash timecrafting. That's plantoeat.com forward slash timecrafting. The coupon will be automatically applied to your account and can be used when you're ready to subscribe. It's valid for new customers only. Give Plan to Eat a try today. Okay, we're going to take a break from the conversation, but when we come back, I'm going to chat with Peter about the framework he's put in place that's mentioned in this book called the Hour Glass of Honesty. But first, I want to talk about the sponsor for this episode, Fundrise. Now, we've heard for years that it's important to have a diversified portfolio, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, that kind of thing. But if you've ever looked at a breakdown of the most successful portfolios, you'll typically see a diversified set of real estate. So why isn't it one of the first asset classes you consider when you're looking to diversify? Well, simple. It hasn't been available to investors like you and me until now. Thanks to Fundrise. They make it easy for all investors to diversify by building you a portfolio of institutional quality real estate investments. So whether you're just starting to invest in real estate or looking to add more, Fundrise has got you covered. To date, Fundrise manages more than $1 billion in assets for over 130,000 investors. And since 2014, the Fundrise platform has averaged 87 to 12.4% annual returns and investors have earned more than $79 million in dividends alone. That's incredibly impressive. And Fundrise's team of real estate professionals carefully vets and actively manages all of their real estate projects. And with their easy-to-use website, you can track your portfolio performance and watch as properties across the country are acquired, improved, and operated via asset updates. So start building your better portfolio today. Get started at fundrise.com slash timecrafting to have your first 90 days of advisory fees waived. That's fundrise.com spelled F-U-N-D-R-I-S-E dot com slash timecrafting to have your first 90 days of advisory fees waived. Again, fundrise.com slash timecrafting. I'd like to thank Fundrise for sponsoring this episode of the Productivities Podcast. And now let's get back to my conversation with Peter Kozadoy here on the Productivity is Podcast. I want to talk a bit about uh, fear because mm -hmm. the 
adopting and, and letting those biases and those those thoughts that are already there, the things that kind of infiltrate, right? Steering away from those, there's a sense of fear. And I know you've got a blog post, which I'll link to, that talks about that as well. What role does fear play when it comes to honesty? Well, that's that's it, right? Fear and psychological protection are the twin empowerments of dishonesty, right? There's no reason to lie to ourselves or others unless we think wrongly, by the way, that it's in our own best interest because we fear, we're afraid of what would happen if we were just you know, brutally honest. Now, I can understand this because you know, one of the, the things I struggled with, and ironically, Mike, you know, again, get to be honest about it, is uh, when I turned 30, I had uh, quite the quarter life crisis. Uh, have you turned 30? I don't know who I'm, survives this. I am, I am 15, 16 years past 30, so I made it through. <laughs> oh my gosh. I, uh, one time I was doing a keynote talk and I, I, I said that and it's, I, I was gonna, I was about to say, I said that joke, but it's not a joke. 30 was terrible for me. And, uh, a, a very lively older woman stood up in the front row and she said, I've turned 30 twice. And I said, well, I don't know how the heck you've survived it you know, <laughs> once, never mind the second time. But anyway, uh, you know, so it, what, what happened was, you know, I, um, I had had two really big failures, what I, what I considered to be failures in my teenage years. I, at 17, I was convinced that I was going to the Olympics as a figure skater. I was a very uh, highly trained uh, figure skater for 15 years. Olympics was the goal. And I was also, uh, you know, 100% sure I was going to Harvard. Several of my family members have gone to Harvard. I grew up outside of Boston. That was just the way my life was going to go. By 18, it was clear neither one of those things was going to happen. And uh, it was a devastating time. And it fueled my 20s. You know, it, it really gave me chips on my shoulder to build, uh, you know, what turned out to be an Inc. 5000 marketing agency with offices here in the US and in Canada. And, and uh, the problem was, you know, I got very good at helping organizations and leaders see uh, what was true. And after I turned 30, I had realized that those big failures I had as a teenager had had me accepting a second best scenario. You know, yeah, I'd achieved some success, but I had really denied myself all the first best, most important goals I had because I figured, well, now I don't deserve to achieve those. I already missed it. Right. right. So, you know, the irony was I had to get honest with myself, you know, for the first time. And one of the things I got honest about, you know, in, in all the things I wanted to achieve, one of them was writing a book. You know, it's just in my identity to be an author. So I I sat down to write a book. Now that's been a four-year journey. You and I are talking. Right now, at this moment, my book's due out like on Tuesday. We're what, uh, four days away, mm -hmm. okay? And it's been a four-year journey of hell. I mean, it it was really, really hard. <laughs> and it's cost a lot of time and it's cost a lot of money. And I'm sure there are opportunity costs I haven't even thought of. And there's no guarantee of success. Being honest is not easy. It's very difficult. Right. You should be afraid of it. I didn't write a book about how to achieve comfort. I wrote a book about how to achieve results. And if we, we have two choices, right? We can either deny what's true and have regrets and never know, or we can be honest about what we really want, who we are, and what it's going to take to achieve the life and business that we want and go and do it. And we have the freedom to do that. So it really, it's up to us whether we're going to be honest or not about it. To me, one of the things that I think that can get in the way of this, I know I've come across it as well. Speaking of honesty, I'm going to get honest here as well, is Sometimes I think I take on too much and have so many things going on that there is some sort of self-sabotaging going on. You know what I mean? Where you take on so much that uh, maybe to prove, in my case, you know, hey, I've got a productivity system in place. I'm a productive guy. Let's, let's show them how productive I can be. Let's, and, I mean, I, I've gotten better at simplifying because that makes it easier, gives me room to breathe, makes it easier for me to be more honest about what I, you know, not only honest with myself, but then honest with others. And I want to get definitely get into the hourglass that you talk about in the book. But do you find that when through your work and, and you know, we'll link to your, your, your TEDx talk as well. Like, I mean, you've been really digging into this. You've talked about four years, this being a four year journey. Um, I think, is that one of the things that you've come across is, hey, I'm doing so much because if I have a lot of plate spinning and stuff like that, that people see this, what's going on, but it's not really like it gives me permission to go, oh, I'm sorry, I'll get to that later. Or, oh, yes, I'm going to do this. And then it kind of falls through the cracks because you've you've kind of got smoke and mirrors going on. Do you, do you know what I'm talking about? 
Yeah, I do. So I run, a, so I've coached hundreds of entrepreneurs, you know, helping them build their own million dollar company. And every month I run a forum group for entrepreneurs. I have a couple groups and we all come together on Zoom for a couple hours. And the whole idea is we get very honest and very vulnerable in a 100% confidential space about what's really happening you know, in our personal lives, family lives, business lives. Inevitably, Mike, when we talk about productivity and achieving results and success, however they define it, it is never a matter of adding things. It is rarely a matter of modifying things. It is mostly a matter of taking things away. Right. About attrition. You know, and I say that about honesty. Like honesty is an act of omission. It's not an act of do more or do different. It's it's take out the BS, take out the biases, take out the blockers, and you're left with what's true. So, you know, when I look at things that I've done over the years and look at how much busy work I did, how many things I thought were important that I spent time on that I find, oh, they're really not. You know, now I've gotten, you know, with with time and wisdom, much better at reminding myself what's the actual goal? No, no, not not the side goal, the end goal, and go directly there. Like like I like to tell my clients, like, do not pass go, do not collect two hundred dollars, just go from the square you're on to the square you're trying to go to. And and it's amazing how many people make up things that they think they need to go from A to B. It's like, oh well, I can't I can't be an author. I don't have a social media following. Okay, so. Oh, well, I can't write a book uh, because I would have to, you know, talk it out. I can't sit down and I don't type that fast. And I mean, it's like all of these things we throw in front of us mm-hmm. and we're like, okay, well, I guess I need to build a social media following then if I want to write a book. No, just go write the damn book, you know? So, you know, these again, psychological protection that, and you, you reference, uh, you know, self-sabotage. These things that we often frame as, oh, I need to get more productive is really just you're self-sabotaging yourself in one way, shape, or form. And it's up to us to get honest about that frame of reference, because if we don't identify it for what it is, we're just going to sit and stew in it. What was your epiphany about honesty? You've talked about like when the book became a marketing book, and then, you know, when, when it was, oh, no, this is a book about honesty. Anyone who's, you know, that adage, write what you know. When was there, was there a moment, you know, where you're, where, you know, you said, oh yeah, I fell down this well, I tripped up. Maybe I waited (laughs) and treaded water in this well for a while because I wasn't living up to that. Like where can you trace back to when that moment was? And then maybe when the, the, the switch kind of flipped for you. Yeah. I mean, certainly for some reason that, that turning 30 was a big wake up call for me. I don't know exactly why. And what I have ended up, you know, understanding it, and particularly with this book, where I started out as, you know, how do I write a book in relation to my company? And just, just diverging those two things was, was an interesting epiphany, right? It's like, right. oh, wait, I don't, I don't have to write a marketing book because I own a marketing agency. I can write the book that I want to write to, to positively impact people for, for how I think they should. And what's one of the phrases, you know, for anyone out there who's been interested in writing a book that I've been fascinated by and I turn over in my mind all the time is this, this author, much more successful than I am, just said it to me like offhand in a conversation. He's like, yeah, well, you know, people write the book they want to read. Yeah, I've heard that and before I was too. Like, yeah. Wow, that's really interesting. And, and I, so I've been wondering, like, did I write the book I want to read? And I think so, because I've been so shocked to see how, you know, business, which is so logical, right? Productivity, so logical get so lost in all of our, you know, mental uh, acrobatics. And I used to think I was like alone. I was like, does anybody else see this like tomfoolery happening in these boardrooms? Until I ended up at uh, Columbia Business School where I did an MBA and we got to dive deep into, you know, Warren Buffett since it's where he learned value investing. It's sort of the home of value investing. And he actually has a word for this. It's called the institutional imperative. And it describes how leaders and organizations, and by the way, we are all leaders. Let's be clear about that point. Leaders and organizations uh, just get stuck like rolling down the hill they're rolling on, unable to dislodge themselves and, and, you know, get at the facts and then make valuable change because of those new truths. So it's really, it's a subject I've been fascinated by, Mike, and I guess maybe I did write the book that I, that I wanted to read and I hope others want to read it. Let's uh, talk about um, some of the frameworks, because I think one of the things that the book does well, and it's, again, we talk about this being like a soft skill and you, it, there's strategic elements, 
but you've what you've done is you've put some things in framing so that people can go, oh, they can grab onto it, right? Because it becomes sticky. It doesn't become entangled, but it becomes like, okay, I now, like the hourglass. Like, let's yeah. let's talk a little bit about that because what you've done is, and I've seen this, um, I had a podcast interview with uh, Keith Ferrazzi, and he talk, Keith Ferrazzi, and he talks about, you know, he's good at framing these things because some of the stuff you'd think, oh, well, how does... Uh, how does co-elevation, how do you frame it? How do you make it so that it becomes strategic? And you've done that with, with the hourglass. So let's talk a little bit about that. I know I don't want to go into uh, incredible detail, but I think it's an important distinction for people who are going to pick up the book so that they can say, okay, oh, I get it. And then once I looked at that, as I t- asked you my earlier question about like, okay, you say this to yourself and you say this to others, and there's that effect, that sliding effect or that scaling effect that it it clicked. So can you touch on on the hourglass for a little bit here? Yeah, I'm happy to because you know one of the things I've said is this is not an ethics book. Like I didn't sit down to write an ethics book. I, right. I think people should be generally honest. I think they should be good people, but that's not what this book is. This is a, you know, how to how to make crap tons of money book, right? It's how to achieve <laughs> results in your life book. And so I needed to make sure that I brought honesty into a, a tactical environment where you had a technique to to use it. And as I said earlier, I mean, if you're an entrepreneur, I have a chapter for that. CEO chapter for that. You know, frontline employee chapter for that. So, you know, it's important to me that everyone actually uses this, weaponizes it, because it is such a powerful weapon for for positivity and change. The central framework of the book, Mike, is as you referenced, the hourglass of honesty, and it begins like this. And this, by the way, is the same framework that many of the leaders and organizations in my book have used to make change. Okay. First, we need to get honest about the, what I call the community. You know, at that level, we need to be honest about what's going on in society, you know, how social norms are changing. You know, we live right now, 2020, in a time of uh, pandemic, uh, a pandemic of dishonesty, in addition to the pandemic of COVID-19, um, you know, racial discrimination, gender bias, I mean, all sorts of really big, heady topics are, are being thrust on our society. And we can't bury our heads in the sand about these. I mean, we operate in these environments. And, you know, you look at like the ESG movement for businesses, uh, now paying much more attention to how they take care of communities and vendors and suppliers and employees and the environment. Like this is all about getting honest about what's going on in the world, what we need to do and, and change. After that level, we need to narrow in a bit and, and get honest with and about the others around us. Now, sometimes we do need to be just direct with the people around us, right? Tell like it is, uh, and there are techniques to do that so you don't offend people, like you know, ask permission. Hey, you know, do you mind if I be really honest about you know, some feedback I have? Or, hey, I tend to be kind of direct. Is it okay if I'm direct with you? you? You seem like you can handle it. Yes, okay, get permission, move forward. And sometimes we need to do that, right? It's efficient. Mm-hmm. Other times we need to be honest about others, you know, about what people around us are thinking, feeling, their backgrounds, their viewpoints, how different they might come to a conclusion than, than we, you know, this is where empathy comes into play. And there are ways to, you know, have constructive conversations with people that, by the way, we seem to violate every day. If you watch the news, I mean, we've got divisiveness on every issue and everyone's too so busy jamming their viewpoint down the other person's throat that nobody's standing back and saying like, huh, you know, tell me about that. How, how did you come to that conclusion? You know, what kind of data are you looking at? You know, help me understand. That's honesty, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe I don't know the full story. Help me understand. So once we get down to those two levels, the final level, if you really want to make changes, and again, this is for you as a person or your organization is to get brutally honest with and about yourself, with your own biases, and self-limiting beliefs as a leader. What happens, Mike, is in that instant that you've gotten into what I call honest alignment, in an instant, you've, you've changed. I mean, you're essentially a different human being, right? Honest Mike is very different than dishonest Mike. You know, honest Mike has different wants and dreams and fears and desires and uh, whatever. So what ends up happening, if you can get brutally honest in those levels, you actually as a changed person, end up changing the others around you. And we sort of come back out the other side. So I call it an hourglass. And when you do that, when you change your inner circle, when you change your employees, change your customers, change your your sphere of influence as far as people, that's when you can influence the community. That's when you can achieve game-changing results in your life and business, whether that is for you to write your own book or you know get on the Inc. 5000 list of fastest growing companies or whatever it is. 
you need to go through that transformation process in some way, shape, or form. Peter, normally as we get close to wrapping up, I ask, what's the one thing that someone can do to start that journey, that journey towards honesty? Um, You've kind of given in that last answer a lot of that. But uh, if someone's looking to do this, and other than picking up the book, which of course we can, you know, and we'll have a link to the book in the show notes and everything like that, as, as expected. Again, it's Honest to Greatness, How Today's Greatest Leaders Use Brutal Honesty to Achieve Massive Success. But if someone wants to start today, on this journey, where do they begin? What's one action they can take? You can start right this second with two of my favorite questions that I want everyone in the world to adopt. And it's this, and this works whether you're looking at a news headline on TV or reading your great aunt Millie's Facebook post or thinking a thought in your head. Question one, is that true? And two, how do I know? Just think about it. Every in, input you take in, you know, whether you're in a conversation or you're watching the news or whatever, just ask yourself, is that true? And how do I know? If we can put that, that light wall in front of us, right? Instead of absorbing things and reacting with our you know, primitive reptilian brains, we can just ask ourselves, is it true? How do I know? You would find that many of the things that we just assume to be true, but how we think and feel and things we see, actually aren't or have much more nuance than we may uh, initially think. So I, I hope everyone, Mike, adopts those two questions into their lives and businesses. Peter, where can people keep up with you and pick up the book so that they can start this journey on their, uh, for themselves? Sure. So come have an honest conversation. I'm at honesttogreatness.com. That's honesttogreatness.com. On that site, you can take the free 21-question honesty quiz, which will tell you how honest you really are. It'll tell your honesty profile as a leader uh, if you're brave enough to find out. Um, and for sure, you know, Honest to Greatness is out. It's out, finally out after four years. Uh, everywhere books are sold. And uh, if you love it, go to Amazon, give me a review. If you hate it, go to Amazon, give me a review. You get to be honest. That's the good part. Peter, thanks so much for taking the time today to join me on the Productivities Podcast. My pleasure. Take care.